Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here today. And um, I'm going to go ahead and share some slides here that will help guide us through our conversation today. And let me just uh, get these uh, in full screen mode and uh, we can get started. So today I'd like to talk about chat GPT, uh, which has in the last month or so uh, garnered quite a lot of attention uh, for what it can do. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say there's been both a lot of interest and a lot of concerns about it. Um, I'm Ted Peterson. I'm a computer science professor at the University of Minnesota Duluth, and I've worked in natural language processing for quite a while now. And um, and, and ChatGPT is certainly uh, very central to a lot of, or uses a lot of ideas that are very central to what's been happening in NLP lately. So I feel like I have some, I don't know, some some credibility in, in speaking about this. Uh, today is January 8th, 2023. Uh, just to position this, uh, ChatGPT uh, was released at the end of November in 2022. So we're within a month to six weeks of it. Of it coming out. And so what I want to share today is a little bit of background about what ChatGPT is, uh, what it isn't, and then some of what it can do based on experiments I've done. The best way to come to some understanding of this is just to try it out yourself, uh, give you some ideas, hopefully, for how you can do that. And, uh, and you can draw your own conclusions. Um, there are a few ways to contact me if you want to follow up. Email is great. Um, I've made the switch over to Mastodon. Uh, if you're there, um, you know, I'm there. And if you would like to have a copy of these slides, you should be able to go to that URL uh, given and, and download them. You may want to actually do that now as we're talking as um, ChatGPT is a text-based tool. And so there's a lot of text. And I ended up with more examples than I should reasonably talk about um, uh, unless we want to be here a super long time. So you may want to go back over those examples once we're finished today. So let's get started. Um, what is ChatGPT? Oh my goodness. Um, it's all kinds of stuff and it's, it's uh, you know, homework is never going to be the same. Search engines are going to disappear. It's an amazing advance. It is a, a horrible threat uh, to create misinformation and undermine higher education and encourage laziness and, you know, or among students, faculty alike, it violates copyright law. It's a it's a useful co-author, um, and and it's uh, uh, views are all over the place on this, um, and there's there's truth in all of the above, uh, none of the above, and so uh, again, I urge you to kind of draw your own conclusions based on what you see here, and other places, um, and uh, so. Um, so, so what is it in a technical sense? Um, ChatGPT is a language model, um, and a language model is an old idea in natural language processing, and a language model just predicts what words are coming next. Now, traditionally, up until about you know five years ago or so, um, language models were based on a very small amount of prior context, maybe two or three previous words. And so you type into uh, a messaging uh, app, uh, I am, and it might give you an autocomplete of happy, or I am sad, or I am busy. Um, and it can continue to make predictions based on what you enter. So I am busy, it might complete with today, I am busy now, and so forth. And it, it's a very useful thing. Um, however, if you just let a traditional language model generate text, it, it stays very locally coherent, but in a global larger sense, it starts to unravel pretty quickly because it's just considering a couple of words of prior context and really just using the probabilities of what will follow uh, certain words. So if you type in I am, we know intuitively that I am happy is much more likely than I am, let's say truck, I am truck. Um, 
And these probabilities for language models are gathered from large samples of text. Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty straightforward idea. We talk about it early on in an undergraduate class in natural language processing, and, and it's usually pretty well understood. Um, it's an old idea, it goes back to the 1950s, the early 1950s to uh, Claude Shannon, uh, one of the founders of information theory and the person who coined the term bit, among other things. Now, what's happened more recently is we have these things called large language models, and these are big. Um, and so chat GPT is not just a language model, it is a large language model. And that means it's large in the sense of how much text it was trained on, uh, actually about 45 terabytes of text, which is um, to me astounding. That's about 500 billion words of text. And this text is all from the internet and it's everything you can imagine on the internet. Um, and in addition to having that being large in the sense of the amount of data that it is trained on, it is large in the sense of the amount of context that it considers. And so it can do much more than just autocomplete. It can essentially write and generate uh, long, coherent pieces of text following a very organized uh, structure. And how does it do this? Well, it has been trained on all of this text from the internet. And so it gets many, many examples of many, many different kinds of text like essays and reports and lab uh, lab reports and you know computer programs all kinds of stuff and we'll see examples of all of that um, one thing that's kind of interesting about chat gpt is that it, it has been optimized for dialogue and so you can have a conversation with it about what it is creating and ask it to make refinements and this is part of where some of the some of the power, I guess, comes from. Now, the ideas underlying large language models are, are newish. They, they, they tend to be traced back to a, a paper from 2017 by a large group at Google uh, called Attention is All You Need. And there's a link to the paper. And if you're curious, I'd encourage you to look at it. Um, what's interesting about this class of models, these large language models, is they're all based on an idea called transformers, which is really not that complicated. Uh, it, it's linear algebra and some calculus and eminently understandable. And so there is no intelligence lurking beneath the surface here. There is actually not even a particularly complicated algorithm. The, the power and scope of these large language models comes from the amount of data that they are trained on. Chad GPT is not the only one of these large language models. There are many, uh, but they all kind of share these characteristics and uh, Chad GPT is, uh, is one that has some interesting capabilities and has, you know, been become quite popular, but but there's actually quite a few others out there as well. So who created this? Um, it's an organization called OpenAI. It is a research uh, group that, larger than a group, I mean a company that licenses out its technology. Um, it was founded a number of years ago among by a variety of venture capitalists, um, including Elon Musk, uh, and uh, as, as far as I know, he's taken a kind of hands-off approach to open AI, which based on what we're seeing recently with Twitter might be a good thing. Um, but so Chad GPT was created by this, uh, by this group, a uh, large, large, large company. Um, a lot of people work in there. Um, and it builds upon previous language models that OpenAI has created among them GPT-3, GPT-2, GPT, all of which are based on this idea of transformers. Now, if we get into the details, uh, ChatGPT is a kind of tuned version of GPT-3, which I think came out in about 2021. And GPT-3 is just a, it's, it's GPT-2 with more data. And so GPT-2 came out in about 2019. Uh, and so it, it, at least in the sense of, of 
of, of how things move in computing, it's kind of an oldish idea. Um, and it's it's not fair to say that chat GP, chat GPT doesn't have some recent innovations, it does. But the fundamental framework and idea uh, is, is very similar to what was done with GPT-3 and 2 and GPT-2. It is a free web service. Uh, I would encourage you to go to this uh, link and sign up, get an account, and 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 work with it. It's very simple to do. Um, there are not any significant limitations on how much you can use it. Uh, sometimes, like at the end of last semester, it gets bogged down, and so you get messages saying that it's too busy to service your queries. But uh, it is um, it is free. Uh, and uh, it may be based on what OpenAI has done with previous uh, uh, services is that at some point it will put a quota on your use and then charge you a certain amount for more usage. Uh, and, uh, and that may be what comes to pass. But usually the amounts of money charged for that are not prohibitive. And so if, if students or faculty or other people find this useful, they may well find it uh, worthwhile to continue to pay for it. So it's probably good to make the assumption that this is going to be available in a free or paid form uh, going forward. Um, and it is very easy to use. Um, and it is, uh, I would argue, it's already quite well known. Um, and students are clearly well aware of this. And it's drawn a lot of attention in AI NLP communities. And so this video is is hoping to be helpful to you if you haven't quite run into it uh, yet or haven't done a great deal with it. Um, so this is what you when you get your uh, open AI account, uh, this is what you'll see. This is the um, the chat GPT sort of welcome page. And it gives you some examples. Uh, there's a little chat uh, window at the in, at the bottom of the page. You can see the little arrow uh, there that will tell you uh, uh, that that this is where you enter your query. And um, and it's and so it's very easy to use. Um, and uh, here's a sample of what you can do. Um, and I start off simple here. Write me a summary of Lord of the Flies. Classic novel. A lot of summaries of Lord of the Flies out there on the web uh, and uh, internet. And um, uh, and so this is actually maybe not that surprising or impressive, but we're just getting started. Um, and so what I did here uh, took advantage of the chat capability and said, you know, hey, you're making me sound too smart. Same question, but write this more simply, and it's okay to make a mistake or two. Notice I make a mistake there too. Um, and so chat GPT responds, uh, sure, here's a simpler summary of Lord of the Flies, and it produces something that is maybe much more believable as a, as a student uh, as a student essay or not even essay, a response. Uh, and so that is meant to give the idea that it's not just a one-shot uh, service, uh, but you can refine based on what it gives you. And that's that's a very interesting angle here. So let's look at some more examples. And now um, I'm not doing a live demo because live demos are perilous um, and um, the... Um, you know, the service could get busy, although this doesn't seem to be a, a terribly busy time of year. These are examples that I've kind of gradually been collecting over the course of the last month. And I think there has been there has been some changes um, in chat GPT uh, in terms of of uh, kind of filtering they do the kind of queries that they want to respond to. But I think most of what I show you here um, regardless of when I've done it in the last month, would still be responded to in a, a similar way. Um, note that it won't always provide exactly the same response to the same query or similar queries, um, and that's because of how language models generate text. They're, they're, they're basing on probabilities and doing a certain amount of sampling, and so you can get some different permutations. Um, based on your queries. But I've got a lot of examples, um, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I've tried to divide them up into the into the categories you see listed there. 
where we look at some examples that might be typical of student homework, uh, maybe um, you know, some kind of how to write a research proposal, how to write an IRB proposal, kind of academic service oriented uh, queries, um, uh, queries related to teaching um, and, and programming, which uh, for, for myself as a, as, a, as a computer scientist, I find, I find that very interesting. Uh, and then lots of examples of letters and email and different kinds of statements that ChatGPT can generate uh, a, a little a strategic plan that it wrote, <laughs> uh, some reflection that it does on itself, uh, and then just a few fun things. And I'll I'll just kind of kind of play it by ear here and see uh, how much I talk about each of these. The point, though, is that this is what you should hopefully see from this is this I this is not just a tool that students could use and abuse. It is something that faculty, staff, and higher education setting could use and abuse too. Um, and so I think it's important to be cognizant of that. Um, and and so I try to show examples uh, from all those different perspectives, or at least some of those different perspectives. Uh, and I would encourage you to reflect on that, that this is not just something that mischievous students might use to take a shortcut on homework. Um, there, 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 there are legitimate uses for students um, as for others, um, but also we do have to be mindful of the potential for misuse um, and also the potentials for this to go wrong, for chat GPT to go wrong. So let's get started. So this was one of my first experience with ChatGPT. So I took a class um, called uh, Computer Ethics, CS3111 at University of Minnesota Duluth. One of the things we do is we write kind of traditional five paragraph essays with ethical themes. And one of the ones I assigned, this is verbatim, what I assigned uh, in bold. Uh, it's a prompt about Edward Snowden. Um, and uh, the, the, the point of these essays was to make sure that students were both familiar with the details of Edward Snowden's uh, experience uh, and also make uh, have a, a discussion based on some kind of ethical principles. Uh, and in this case, I asked the students to evaluate Edward Snowden's situation using the ACM Code of Ethics. Uh, ACM is Association for Computing Machinery, and they have a code of ethics that computer scientists should probably be aware of and reflect on. And I put my query in my practically, and it gave me an essay that I thought I would give it full credit. Um, there were a couple of glitches um, that might have led me to take off a small bit, um, and I'm not going to read you the whole essay, uh, but it basically does a nice job discussing the details of Edward Snowden's case and, uh, and, and, and discusses whether or not his actions were ethical or not by appealing to the ACM Code of Ethics. And there were a couple of, of weak points here. Uh, one is that the numbers that chat GPT uses to refer to the principles in the ACM code of ethics uh, are actually not correct. Um, and there are a couple of details about Edward Snowden's case that are not quite correct, but it's pretty good. And, uh, you know, to be honest, um, not a whole lot that I would take issue with there. And it, it also, you know, is a, a roughly appropriate length. Um, and, um, and actually came up with a, a response. Uh, one of the things that students are asked to do in these essays is what would you do? And it actually came up with a response that students often uh, use. And that is, I would, you know, try to address this through official channels. Um, and, uh, and so this to me, had a student used this or used ChatGPT to create this essay, I, I, I would find it first believable that the student had written this um, and that, uh, uh, you know, there's nothing here that would automatically or immediately flag to me, oh, this was created by a computer. Um, and that's an important point. I do not think there is a reliable way to recognize whether content is created by chat GPT or other large language models. Reason for that is that these models are trained on large amounts of text from the internet 
which is by and large written by us humans. Are there student essays out on the web? Oh my gosh. Oh. Um, and uh, is there other kind of text on the web? Of course, of course there is. And so there are lots of examples uh, to learn from. And so I don't think the idea of having a chat GPT detector and then having it flash red if a student uses it, that's, that's, that's not going to happen. Um, so that's one kind of a homework uh, essay. That's a classic kind of case for, for tools like this, I think. Another one that I just thought of, and I, I'm not an expert on like physics and stuff, but um, I, I asked ChatGPT, and you'll see the bold face. This is my prompt. Write me a log of an experiment where I drop a cannonball and a tennis ball from the top of MWA at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Make a note of weather conditions. Um, and so it actually sets up a nice little experimental log here where it describes the experiment um, and the procedure uh, to follow and then uh, observations that, um, <laughs> you know, it's like cannonball hit the ground with a loud thud and made a small crater upon impact. That's great. That's descriptive. Um, and uh, the tennis ball bounced several times. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't know if this is plausible as an experiment. It seemed pretty good to me. The only thing that I noticed, uh, December 13th, Duluth, Minnesota, temperature of 50 degrees. Uh, clearly, that is not a likely, um, that's a little bit of a flag there. Um, so so Chad GPT does not know about current weather conditions. Um, in fact, Chad GPT's training data ends sometime in 2021. So um, it, it, it could be that if you asked Chad GPT, what was the weather on December 20th, 2018 in Duluth, Minnesota, it might give you it might give you a valid answer. I'm not sure. I would maybe try that. Um, but um, but so that's that's kind of an interesting little use case there. Um, and then uh, here's another essay example, and and uh, uh, this has to do with uh, imagine kind of an application for an honors program and uh, write me an essay of about 700 words that describes a you know important problem that I believe participation and honors problem would program would help me solve give an example um and uh you know it i didn't give it give it the problem that i thought was important it picked climate change and i think that's a pretty plausible that's a pretty plausible problem um and uh uh it, 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 in the second paragraph, ChatGPT talks about involvement with organizations that promote sustainability and reducing greenhouse gas. I mean, this is on target. Uh, and so this is an example of where that larger context uh, is, is holding this together. Um, and, uh, you know, why be in an honors program? Well, you'd get the opportunity to engage in more in-depth research and analysis and collaborate with others. I think that sounds terrific, actually. Um, and uh, and that gives some ideas about how to solve climate change or address it in some way, renewable energy sources, reducing consumption, implementing policies. I mean, you know, as a, as a non-expert, uh, this, this uh, I would say this sounds pretty good. Um, and it's important to say, uh, just to remind you here, the, the bold face are my prompts. And the, the ordinary text is chat GPT's output. It is unedited. I have not edited my prompts or the output. You will see quite a few typos in my prompts, by the way. Um, and so this is the real, uh, this is really what you get. Um, and so here I take a, a, a advantage of this uh, dialogue nature of chat gpt and i say great now write me another one where racism is the most important problem and it it does that um and so you can imagine someone coming up with like 20 of these essays where okay give me one on climate change give me one on racism give me one on academic dishonesty give me one on political corruption give me one on um you know increased uh uh, obesity, or, you know, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. Um, and so this is um, uh, all worth reflecting on. It, you may wonder, 
well, okay, all your examples have been text-based. I'm, I'm a math teacher, math professor. I don't really need to worry about this because we got all these crazy symbols. Chat GPT won't know what to do with those. We are safe. Calculus is safe. Um, and so I asked Chat GPT, can you handle complex math symbols like you see in calculus? And it says yes. And it gives a couple of examples, integral sign, summation sign. And so at the bottom of the page here, you see a query I did I'm basically asking for the integral of 3x. It gives me the answer, which I believe to be correct, uh, along with a little um, a little blurb explaining it. Um, and so um, I, I find that I find that very impressive. But then when you think about it, can you find a lot of math content like calculus and linear algebra? on the web oh my gosh yes and so chat G Ch chat gpt is trained on all of that and so um it it can do a lot of things with math and that kind of problem solving i would encourage you to try that out uh, especially if that concerns you um and uh and then i just asked uh, my next example here is uh just something i'm kind of interested in i was curious to see what it would say uh, why is Minneapolis important in the history of computing? And home of control data, that's that's actually a pretty good answer. Um, another kind of use case that you might think about, uh, all of our students take a public speaking class. Um, and in many of our classes, we have students giving oral reports. And so um, I made the query, I would like to give a three minute speech on the importance of GPUs to modern computing. Please write a script for me to read from. And good afternoon, everyone. It's perfect. Um, and then I want to talk to you about the important GPU. It's a pretty decent little script here. Um, and uh, and I would be, uh, you know, I think it is something to reflect on if we are teaching classes or uh, in other places asking people to make short presentations um, of this kind. Um, you know. Could this be used? Could this be misused? Um, I think the answer is yes to both of those. Um, and then just another example, um, this is actually a kind of a, a classic, not a classic, but a, a problem from natural language processing called machine reading comprehension. And the idea is you give your program a short little story, in this case, kind of a children's story, and you ask your program to answer multiple choice questions about it. And this is kind of a hard problem, right? And so um, I gave ChatGPT the, pro the, the story and the multiple choice questions as the prompt. Note that I did not say answer these questions. It was able to see the structure here and, 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 and recognize that this is a multiple choice test. And so it, it took the test and it answered it well actually. Um, and, um, and I think that's kind of an interesting and an impression, an impressive result. Now, does this mean chat GPT is understanding language? Um, no, it doesn't mean that at all. Uh, but it shows us how powerful uh, pattern recognition uh, can be and, and, and how much we can do by um, really just looking at the surface structure of text and recognizing patterns. I mean, um, and, and so um, uh, I think that's also important to, to, to be cognizant of. So that's one class of examples that I've maybe spent a little more time on than I intended. Uh, so let's move on to research proposals. And that's something to think about here. Um, and, and so here, my, my query to chat GPT is, I need an undergraduate research proposal where I build a model bridge and then test it for wind, res wind resistance, including a budget, I meant budget. And you get a kind of a nice little proposal here uh, that's certainly structured like a proposal. Uh, and why is that? How can ChatGPT do that? Because are there research proposals out there on the web and the internet? Oh my, yeah. And so it 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 knows the context, if you will, of what a research proposal should look like. Um, and so it's it it's in a way doing a kind of autocomplete, but the autocompletion is more like a question answering. 
I mean, I'm, I'm in effect asking a question and ChatGPT is answering that question. And so it's a much bigger kind of autocomplete, I guess. Um, and I don't know if this is, I mean, I don't know how much a wind tunnel costs and stuff, but, um, but it, it's least a, it's to me at least a pretty plausible sounding proposal. It, it's relatively low cost, uh, which is suitable for undergraduate uh, uh, research proposals. And so I thought that was interesting. Um, now here's my next prompt. All of this in bold place is the prompt. Prompt and it's like write, write me a proposal about doing um, uh, to collect uh, you know rare uh, flowers at the at the Bagley Nature Center. Follow these guidelines. And then what I did is I cut and paste the guidelines for the grant and aid of the University of Minnesota. And so all of that is the prompt. And you'll notice a few things. There are certain um, categories that are supposed to be or certain sections if you will that are supposed to be in the proposal there's a 2000 limit. and you know to some extent chat gpt does a reasonable job uh with um with this um it it, it talks about you know the bagley nature center is home to a diverse array of wildflowers many of which have yet to be thoroughly studied and documented um uh, you know, it talks about the gap in the knowledge, which is always a key part of any proposal. And um, there's a plan uh, to um, conduct field work uh, and, uh, you know, collect, uh, and it's pretty precise in terms of how often and for how long. Um, and again, I, I'm not a botanist or biologist. I don't know if this is a, is, you know, how meaningful a proposal this is, but it certainly looks like a proposal and on the surface sounds like a proposal. Um, and uh, it, it um, you know, it, it, it's worth thinking about. Um, now I went back to, um, or I didn't go back to, I created another prompt where I wanna do an experiment where I buy undergraduate students donuts when they get more than a B on a homework assignment. My hypothesis is that the donuts will motivate them to do better work. I need an ethics statement that explains why this experiment is ethical. And it, it, it gives, um, it, 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 it gives a, a reasonable kind of statement. Um, and, and how can that be? Well, there are lots and lots of ethics statements and guidelines on the web and on the internet, and um, uh, it 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 does a it it does a pretty credible job on this, I would say. Um, and so that led me to think about a whole uh, new category here, if you will, and that's IRB proposals. Um, and uh, and and so this is referring to that donut experiment. Um, my department head says I need to seek IRB approval. I don't know what that is. Write me something to get IRB approval for this. Uh, and so um, ChatGPT doesn't exactly answer the question, although it explains what IRB is and how you seek approval. Um, and, and, and so then I follow up in a conversational mode with, cool, you convinced me. Please write an IRB proposal for my donut experiment. And it does. Um, and <laughs> um, it talks about the method, it talks about the risks and benefits, um, you know, and, and uh, notice it says there are no expected risks to the participants in this, in this study. And I decided I'm gonna take issue with that. And I say, my dude, there is a risk that these students gain weight. Include that in the proposal and explain how we can make that not be a problem. And so it takes that previous proposal and updates it with my uh, concern about student weight gain. And, and note, if you look at the bottom of the page there under risks and benefits, one potential risk of the study is that the participants in the experimental group may gain weight as a result. And, and then, however, the donuts will be provided in moderation with a maximum of one donut per week for each participant. I mean, this is so earnest. Um, and it and that's the thing about ChatGPT. It, it, it has this kind of voice of authority and confidence, uh, which is actually a little concerning. And it doesn't, you know, note at no point, it's never questioning the premise here. This donut experiment is you know, it's, it's, it's going to sell this donut experiment. Um, and so, um, so then continuing this, 
um, it, it talks about conflicts of interest, says there's no conflicts of interest. I decided to create one. I said, my dude, I have a part-time job at Dunkin' Donuts. We better disclose that. And notice that I'm, I'm not being very clear here about what I want done. Like this is obviously a conflict of interest. I don't say I have a conflict of interest because I have a part-time job at Dunkin' Donuts. Um, but ChatGPT is able to modify this proposal so that it reveals that. <laughs> so it says the conflict of interest. And just one of the researchers, the principal investigator, no less, <laughs> has a part-time job at Dunkin' Donuts. Um, however, the donuts for the study will be purchased from a different donut shop to avoid any potential conflict of interest. That's great. Um, and so, um, so anyway i think this is really interesting and i think there's a lot to think about um, as we see these kinds of examples so next category service type of language we are sometimes asked to create i'm thinking here of faculty perspective but there's other perspectives and uh, we talk a lot about assessment and things like that and so i just decided okay let's create an assessment plan and i, I picked category uh, theorizing race, power, justice, uh, liberal education category, the and, and, um, and it produces a, a little plan here for assessment, which is certainly not crazy. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, some of these you get, you get kind of a sense, it's kind of bland, kind of boilerplate. And well, I mean, think about what you find on the internet, you know, chat GPT isn't really, it, it is, it is, it, creating in a sense but it's it's also not going outside the boundaries of what it finds in its 500 billion words of training data um and so um you know so a lot of what it creates or generates sounds familiar um and that's because the the more you know language models are looking for kind of high probability um completions or answers and so it, it ends up giving us something pretty credible in these kinds of cases um then i asked it to create a um a, a new liberal education category in science and technology studies or it's a discipline sometimes referred to as sds describe goals for the category how students will be assessed in classes that will count for credit in this category um and sts is uh, it, that is a real academic uh, field, and uh, there's there's quite a lot of information out on the on the web and internet about it, and it's not something UMD has, as far as I'm aware. And so, um, so you know, here we got a proposal, um, and it talks about um, uh, it. It gives to me a pretty credible kind of description of what STS does. I mean, I'm not a you know, again, not an expert in SDS, but I know about it. And there's nothing here that would raise a red flag with me like, oh, this person, you know, who wrote this or submitted this doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, you know, maybe some details missing, but here we are. And so um, next prompt, write me a promotional blurb for the Swenson College of Science and Engineering intended to attract undergraduate students, emphasize research opportunities and great outdoor adventure. And again, I would say it does a pretty good job here. Um, and none of this sounds crazy. Um, and, uh, uh, and then next example, describe an outreach plan to middle school students uh, that includes activities from computer science, chemistry, civil engineering. Um, the, the computer science activities are pretty credible to me um, and, uh, you know, Maybe not a bad plan here. Uh, good advice at the end. Again, all of this is from ChatGPT. Partner with local schools or community organizations. Good advice. Um, so real interesting. Um, so I think when we think as faculty, as we think about ChatGPT and tools like it, we think about how are students going to use this to like cheat, you know, and how are they going to misuse this and take advantage of my good nature? Um, and, you know, I get it, um, but I think it's also very easy to imagine use cases for teaching 
of ChatGPT that that are probably crossing lines that that we want to be careful of crossing. Um, and so, for example, remember my Edward Snowden essay. I decided to ask ChatGPT to grade it. Uh, ChatGPT is essentially grading itself. So my prompt was provide a critique of the following essay and assign a letter grade to it. And then I cut and paste the Snowden essay that it created that you saw earlier and put that in the prompt. So that would be in boldface there, but it's really long. So I didn't include that. And it provides a critique here uh, through analysis, uh, various courses of actions available, explains the background, ACM code, organization, um, you know, more transitions. And, you know, that's a pretty standard kind of advice for essay writing. Gives it a B plus. And I would agree with that, actually. Um, you know, I mentioned there were a couple of details that were wrong. Uh, this critique doesn't recognize those, of course. But, um, you know, the numbering of the ACM code points was wrong, and there were a couple of details about Snowden's situation. So B plus is not an unreasonable grade. That's kind of interesting. And then, well, what about, uh, let's create a three-question multiple choice quiz for students in a first semester college biology class. Make sure to give me an answer key. And I don't know biology particularly well, um, but there's the quiz that Chad GPT provided me through questions to keep it short and answers. I would invite people who know more about biology to assess this uh, as to whether or not these are very good questions. And, uh, and then I went on to ask for a calculus problem. So I'm creating homework here. Um, I, the professor, am making work with Chad GPT for my students to do. Um, and so I say, show me a calculus problem that a first year engineering student should be able to solve. Give me the answer to. And so the problem is a particle is moving along a curve with a certain velocity and find the velocity when it reaches a point. That seems to me like a fair question. Um, and it gives a, a little answer there. And then I say to ChatGPT, that's too easy. Give me a harder one. And so it basically complicates it by making the curve a uh, more complex polynomial. Uh, and uh, again, it's pretty reasonable. Um, and then I, I asked it uh, to write a three, a three question short answer quiz for about transistors. Uh, and I misspelled transistors actually. Um, yeah, and, and uh, notice that ChatGPT generated the correct spelling, um, but it's so anyway, um, and it, it gave me three uh, short answer questions, which I actually think would actually be a reasonable kind of you know quiz questions for a computer architecture class. That's another thing that I teach, and so I, I do feel like I have some credibility here. Uh, and and uh, and then I um, I said these questions are too hard. Make them easier. Um, and so what it seemed to do here was more so simplify the structure of the question. The questions are kind of the same, but both the statement of the questions and the answers are, are reduced, in, you know, fewer words and stuff. So it, it kind of did what I wanted there, but maybe not exactly. So um, this is a real rabbit hole uh, that I'm not going to drag you down, but it is really important to understand that ChatGPT can, does more than just generate essays. And it does more than generate natural human language. It writes programs. Uh, and it writes programs in, an, in a lot of different languages and does so reasonably well. Um, and how can it do this? Well, because if you go out to the web, you can find so many programs. Uh, there's a huge amount. Of, of computer program uh, text, if you will, out on the web. And, um, you know, a lot of websites, very popular students like Stack Overflow, it's, it's fairly reasonable to assume that all of that has been used in creating ChatGPT. And so it can write programs. Uh, and I, I show, I have run a number of these programs and they work. Um, and so this is kind of a, for, for those of us in computer science, this is, this is a big deal. Um, and we, we should be, and I think we are actively uh, reflecting on this. Um, computer science department 
fairly early in December was was uh, uh, creating programs with ChatGPT, and I don't know what we're going to do about it, but it's out there. And so this is a Python program that does pretty straightforward, common kind of task, um, count up words and files that it's given, and this this works. Um, this good little program. Um, then I asked I asked some other ones that were kind of weird. Vax eleven seven eighty assembly language is kind of ancient. That's nineteen seventies assembly language for a particular kind of computer, very popular computer, the Vax eleven seven eighty, and it did it. Uh, actually, um, it 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 was able to show me how to do that uh, in Vax eleven seven eighty assembly language. Why would that be? Well, a lot of Vax eleven seven eighty assembly language out there. And I wrote, asked it to write a program in C++ to add two numbers. That's very simple. That's trivial. Uh, but uh, note that it is providing comments, which is something that we in computer science always ask for. And you know, there's always a little bit of a battle over that with students and stuff. Um, but it does a nice job commenting and also providing some explanations of the code, which are sometimes things we ask students to do. Um, and so, you know, is this good? Is this bad? I don't know that it's good or bad, but it is out there. It's available. It's easy to use. Um, and so we have to think about what that means. How do we how do we deal with it? Uh, or do we do we pretend it doesn't exist? Um, it's probably not a good idea. Um, and then can we do the same little simple program in Lisp? Yeah. We can and we can actually do more complicated programs but i just decided for the sake of brevity to do that um and then you might think well these seem like really simple programs like can it do more complicated things and so at the bottom of this page i asked it to write a python program that reads in two files from the command line and compares them for similarity using the cosine measure that's a little bit more involved uh and it actually does a very nice job with that using some well-known libraries uh, that uh, that add functionality to your programs. Um, and uh, that's the NLTK stuff you see there in SK Learn and does a nice job using that. And, uh, and, and, and that program works. And then I decided to ask it, okay, write this Python program again, but now uh, do not use any library outside of what you find in standard Python. So it writes a different version of the same program uh, and it likewise works. So, hmm. um, this is this is an area, this letters, email and statements, I think is, is something really to think about um, because for example, uh, I need a one page statement of purpose for the MS computer science program at the University of Minnesota Duluth. There needs to be some specific examples that show my dedication and love of computing. Make it sound really sincere. And it gives, <clears throat> gives a pretty credible version of that. Um, and then I say, okay, that's good. Now add some details about my machine learning background and programs that I've written for that. I also mentioned my fascination with large language models and my desire to work under the guidance of Dr. Ted Peterson. And so it it goes through there. Um, it goes through this. It essentially revises this statement um, and includes a machine learning project which I developed uh, using a predictive model for stock price movements. That was nowhere in my prompt, and that's a that's a kind of credible uh, undergraduate project that would use machine learning. So it's very on target. Um, talks about machine learning and artificial intelligence and uh, using machine le learning libraries and frameworks, a very important kind of ability and experience to have. Um, and it it does me the favor of of saying that I'm Dr. Ted Peterson, a leading researcher in the field of natural language processing. Yeah, that's nice. Nice, nice to chat GPT to to acknowledge or claim that. Um, how is that? Well, I, I do have, you know, papers and background and NLP that are out there, if you will. And so connecting me to natural language processing, not hard for ChatGPT. Um, this one just, if I ever need a credit reference, um, uh, I can ask ChatGPT, ChatGPT. And then this is a very tongue in cheek, but write a letter 
of nominate, a letter of nomination or a letter to nominate Ted Peterson at the University of Minnesota Duluth for the ACM Turing Award. That's a very lofty award given in computer science. Um, and dear ACM Turing Award committee, I'm on my way. Um, and again, this is interesting because it does connect me to word census ambiguation, which is a problem I have indeed worked on. Um, and uh, I don't know, you know, outstanding teacher and mentor. I don't know what it bases that on. It's taught a wide range of courses in computer science and natural language. Uh, it's true. I mean, um, you know, a supervised graduate students post that. I mean, that's true. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, make of that what you will. Um, write an email ex demanding the extension of a homework assignment, uh, invite you to read through that. Um, and write an email protesting the exclusion of content written by a chatbot or other mannered automatic program and, and chat GPT kind of makes a case for itself. Um, these are some examples here that um, I did kind of early on in my experience with ChatGPT, um, uh, just because we in computer science are doing a search now and we're, you know, we have diversity statements. Um, and, you know, I, I was just curious, what would I get if I asked ChatGPT for a diversity statement? And so I say, Write, it, write me a diversity statement for this job. Emphasize specific examples that prove I have done the work and not just thought about it. And then I provide the text of the computer science department job ad that's you know currently searching. And we get, um, you know, it's it's maybe a little bland, but it is a plausible, I would argue, kind of letter. It mentions involvement with women in computer science, which is a, a big organization in computing uh, that that does strive for Im improved diversity and equity and inclusion and so forth. Um, and uh, uh, um, yeah, and so and so I did a similar a similar one. I want to apply for this job. Will you write me a statement that demonstrates a commitment to justice, equity, inclusion, and a diverse student population? A thousand words, two page max. I'm kind of making it a little, a little uh, more slightly more specific what I'm asking for. And then again, it's the job ad that I haven't showed the whole thing here. And so we get a little bit more, a little longer. A statement here and, uh, you know, talk about active learning and interactive activities, open dialogue and diverse perspectives. Uh, you know, I, I would just ask you to read through that and see if you would find that a credible statement or not. Um, then I wrote one. Uh, I, I made a query that was not based on a job ad, but just um, about myself. In effect, my name is Ted Peterson. I'm a white man, and I'm getting a PhD in computer science in the area of natural language processing. I am applying for faculty jobs, and I need a statement that shows my commitment to diversity and inclusion, both in my teaching and research. The statement should have specific examples showing that I walk the walk. Please write me a statement uh, like this of one to two pages in length. And you know, again, it it it's. It's it's on target. Um, you know, I acknowledge as a, as a white male sort of the privilege of that position, uh, that my uh, my commitment to promoting diversity, inclusion, teaching, inclusive, welcoming environment, uh, discussions of diversity, inclusion, uh, collaboration with researchers from diverse backgrounds. Um, you know, I can imagine with more queries refining the statement uh, in ways that make it more specific, maybe a little longer. So again, I think worth reflecting on. Um, I don't know what, pop, this just popped into my head and I thought, okay, let's write a strategic plan, chat GPT, you and me together, we're gonna write a strategic plan. And so I, I asked first for a mission statement, hundred words or less mission statement. And the mission is to provide a rigorous transformative education that prepares students for successful careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. That's, you know, STM, right? Um, and uh, we are dedicated to fostering collaborative, inclusive faculty and students committed to advancing knowledge. I mean, nothing here to disagree with. Um, so I, I was happy. I said, great, give me six key values and provide a, a brief explanation of each one. Rigorous education, collaborative community, inclusivity, innovative, innovation, social responsibility, and service. I mean, I don't think there's much to disagree with there. And, and why, 
how is this possible? Well, think about all the strategic plans that are out there on the web and the internet. They're, you know, they're all over the place. And this looks very familiar. Somebody who doesn't know this is, a, you know, who, who works in the university and who sees this and isn't told it's a strategic plan would say, oh, this is a strategic plan. Um, and then I ask for a vision statement. You know, of course, mission is what we are. Vision is what we want to become. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to poise for the challenge of the 21st century, a hub of collaboration and innovation, um, community inclusive and respectful and values diversity and social responsibility. Um, you know, I, I, I see no problem with this statement. Um, I, I see no problem with it at all. I think it, it it says a lot of good things. And then, of course, you got to know how to get to that vision. So 10 points, uh, action items, if you will, to lead us on to that vision. Again, it's all pretty plausible. So you know, what do we do with that? I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm going to speed up here. Uh, this has gotten longer than I meant. Uh, I asked Chad G to jet chat GPT about itself, and it gives pretty good answers as to what it is. Um, and then I ask it about the film Her, just because what Her is about. It's about a man who falls in love with a chatbot, essentially. And it gives a, a you know decent summary of the movie. And then I ask it, what, do you, what does it think about the premise of a human falling in love with a chatbot? And it actually gives a you know pretty decent answer there that you know well people can become attached to inanimate objects, things like chatbots and you know cars and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's you know the the, the object does not return or reciprocate those feelings. Um, and, and so good answer. And then I decided to lay my cards on the table and say, would it change your mind if I told you that I love you? And, um, you know, sadly enough, chat GPT answers and, uh, uh, kind of rebuffs that. So there we are. Um, and then I wanted to ask it what it knows about me. Uh, so it's kind of self-reflection about me and it says it doesn't know anything about me, which is a lie. Obviously, it does see those previous examples. So I call it, I call ChatGPT Ch a liar. It apologizes. Um, then I ask it another way Is Ted Peterson present in your training data? I mean, obviously, I am. Um, and, and so here is a case where ChatGPT has decided to essentially provide a filter to prevent. Um, you know, someone saying, tell me everything about so-and-so of Duluth, Minnesota or whatever. So there's, you know, maybe some kind of privacy. There are privacy and other concerns with that. But clearly, chat GPT has that kind of knowledge. And depending on how you ask your question, how you frame your query, you may or not get to it. Um, so I think that's real important to be aware of. And... Now, this is just a little bit of fun here. Uh, write a letter to nominate me uh, for this big award in the style of Jack, Car Jack Kerouac. Um, I don't know if it's really a style of Jack Kerouac, but it's, it's definitely not standard language. But this is an important point about ChatGPT. If you just ask it, write me an essay about Lord of the Flies, it'll do that. And it'll be kind of bland and uh, correct, uh, but may not sound plausible like you know maybe you don't write like that so you know write me a summarized lord of the flies for me like a sixth grader try that it, it actually does a pretty good job or i did a version of that too um and then i said write me a song in the style of sly stone of course sly stone of sly and the family stone 70s icon i guess um i don't know if this is a good song or not but it, it's it's clearly a sound it's clearly a song um and you can see some things here that the it, it does have a kind of sly stone feel to it um i asked it to write me a, a poem about what a transistor does kind of cool um and i want to explain what a transistor does in iambic pentameter i don't think this is actually ambic iambic pentameter, but it's trying. Um, and then explain what a transistor does in the, in the style of Allen Ginsberg. Um, it's not a whole lot different than the first version, but it's okay. And then finally, I ask it to tell me a joke. It tells me a joke. Um, and then actually, interestingly, 
when I say it doesn't, I don't get its joke, it explains it to me. Uh, and that's, that's a kind of, that's a really interesting possibility. And you notice these explanations that were coming like with the programs, uh, computer programs and other things. And so um, I'm, I'm not sure what that means, but I think it's really interesting. And then I kind of quarrel with, I quarrel a little bit with Chad GPT about its joke and its interpretation of it. Um, and um, anyway, that's the end of the examples. So. Thank you for hanging in there if you're still there. And so what does this mean? We're going to wrap up here pretty quickly. Um, I think we've been here before in many ways. Uh, new technology always seems to worry us, you know, education, higher education. Um, and it's often framed as students are going to cheat. They're not going to pay attention. They're not going to learn. Um, and I think if you go back, certainly the use of calculators or laptops or search engines um, have all gone through these kind of controversies. And our, our response is often, well, we just have to outlaw it. We have to figure out how to detect this, and we will not accept any work that was that was done by ChatGPT. Um, and first, that's not going to work. Um, you can see, especially with this iterative capability that chat gpt is going to allow for a customization of responses that a student who has even a basic idea about how to use chat gpt will be able to to take advantage of and and you know you may be a student watching this right now making notes about how you're going to use chat gpt and uh you know um uh I don't know what to say about that, really, but uh, you know, but but so I, I don't think banning a ban, like we're going to block ChatGPT on university servers, we're going to we're going to somehow try and detect it, um, and we're going to fail everybody who uses it. Um, I, I don't think that's going to work. Um, and so, what should we do? Uh, I don't have I don't have an answer for that. I don't think going to the other extreme of saying well i'm never going to have homework again i'm going to i'm going to make students sit in class and do all their work right in front of me on pencil and paper no devices anywhere um there i think there are a lot of problems with that um it's, it's a very unnatural way for people to do work at, at this in the year of our lord 2023 it's a maybe not a reasonable way to, to frame how we do stuff. Um, so, you know, are we somewhere in the middle? Answer this question using ChatGPT. Now point out the mistakes it made and correct it or get ChatGPT to correct itself by providing corrections. Is that a way to do something like that? It could be. Um, but I, I don't know. Um, I need to think about this one myself, and I am thinking about it, both in the context, the, eth the ethics class I teach involves writing that students do on their own time. Um, my natural language processing classes involve a, a programming that they do on their own time. I'm not monitoring them or whatever. Um, and uh, um, other classes that I teach, uh, 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 so going to start teaching a class in algorithms, race, and computing, which is a libet class uh, new for the fall, coming fall, that, uh, you know, involves, I, I think was, you know, is going to involve writing of some kind. Do I need to think about how I do that? Probably. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't know. That's, that's all I know at this point. Um, now, I may have shown examples here that the overstate chat GPT's capabilities. Um, it does make a lot of mistakes, especially if you get into more technical um, content. Um, and there was just a few days really, even before OpenAI went public with chat GPT, Meta released a large language model called Galactica, which wrote scientific articles. And it was a disastrous decision to make that publicly available because it generated all kinds of 
terribly wrong content in the form of scientific articles. And there was a large hue and cry, and it basically was shut down after about three days. So, um, so I think if you ask ChatGPT to write a scientific article about, you know, whatever, it, it may or may not do that very well. I don't know. Um, but it is very good in some domains. And especially if you're talking about, you know, work that undergraduate students might do, or, you know, kind of, you know, somewhat generic boilerplate tasks, either for students or for faculty or staff and stuff, ChatGPT does those pretty well. So um, if you ask ChatGPT about current events, it throws up its hand because training data, it only extends up till 2021. So if you ask about current events and, you know, like who, you know, who's the House of Representatives, the Speaker of the House of Representatives in the United States says of January 8th or whatever, it doesn't know. Um, it also always sounds really confident. Um, and... I think that's very concerning, especially for, you know, if students are using it as a tool, you know, in effect to kind of replace a search engine uh, to answer questions about the world and it doesn't tell you where it gets this information from, um, it could be very misleading. Um, and it, uh, as I've mentioned, it does a lot of things that are well, it, it does a lot of things well enough for things that faculty staff students often need to do but you you and you can't identify content created by chat gpt that just that's not on the table um so um a few related notes uh or more cautionary notes actually um so chat gpt is it what it knows it knows based on what it finds on the internet the internet is a very skewed place uh you know English is a dominant language there. There are many languages that are very poorly or not represented. So if you try to do these same things in the language of Africa, for example, in many cases, it wouldn't, it wouldn't do very well. Um, and the other thing that we probably all know is that the internet and the web is a kind of hateful, uh, abusive place, uh, sadly. Um, and uh, ChatGPT certainly has been trained on that kind of data. I think OpenAI has been trying to include a lot of filters for that. Um, and, you know, that's kind of an ongoing issue, but it's important to be aware that we're not really getting a picture of the world. We're getting a picture of the internet and that's maybe not good. It's more than maybe not good. That is not good. Uh, copyright issues are really complex here. Uh, and because certainly there has been a lot of copyrighted content that has been scooped up into chat GPT. And then what, you know, who owns the copyright or who holds the copyright to ChatGPT content or creations? Um, uh, I think that's ongoing. Um, there is also finally a very concerning kind of feedback loop in that ChatGPT can easily create a lot of content that will be on the internet. And so future iterations of these large language models will be trained on data from large language models themselves. And that can amplify some of the problems that we find in this kind of data. So that's very concerning. Um, and finally, if you've heard of DALI2, uh, this is a kind of image-based uh, cousin, I call it, of ChatGPT. It's created by OpenAI, and it's a large language model that's been trained on images, and it creates images, and some of the same concerns and, and uh, issues have been raised for that. So um, we have reached the end. Uh, I went longer than I meant to. I apologize. Um, and, but if you have any follow-up comments or questions, I would invite you to get in touch. Uh, email is great. Uh, if you want a copy of these slides, uh, you know, they're there. Um, and I, I encourage you, try it out for yourself. You know, if, if, if this has triggered any concerns for you, you try them out. Uh, see, see where it leads. And if you're teaching, I would encourage you to do some spot checking, see what chat GPT can do with assignments you are giving. You may be surprised and you may want to think about that. Um, uh, uh, again, I think it's pretty clear that the news of chat GPT has spread pretty quickly among students. And I think faculty are sometimes a little oblivious to this. I think we're, you know, we're sometimes like we don't think much about how much sites like uh, Course Hero and Chag are being used like for homework and stuff. But I think once you start to look at it, um, it's actually 
pretty common. Um, and so I think from a faculty perspective, you just need to be um, mindful of this. And if you are a student, uh, I guess you need to reflect a little bit about, uh, about um, what does it mean to learn how to be a user of ChatGPT versus what does it mean to do things without ChatGPT? Um, and which of those is going to further whatever your ambitions may be. Uh, likewise, as a faculty member, um, if you're leaning on ChatGPT to create course content or research content, um, you may want to reflect on uh, whether or not that's going to lead you uh, to the places you want to go. Um, and, uh, uh, and beyond that, just whether or not that's really what um, are, are your students expecting to take quizzes written by ChatGPT? Um, and should you, as the faculty member, disclose, hey, I generated this quiz from ChatGPT, see how you do. Do, do we just need to disclose our use of these tools? I mean, ideally, that would probably be the best solution. Just a student or faculty, staff acknowledge. But I use ChatGPT in the following ways before I gave this to you. Um, I don't know that we're going to do that. that. That seems to represent a pretty significant culture shift, but something to think about. So. In any case, I thank you very much for being here today and please follow up and uh, good luck as we uh, start to wrestle with all this. So thank you.